notice today, I put out the seven feasts of the Lord again. This is the updated one for 2024. Last year, we did 2023, and we observed all of these seven feasts. Now, we had covered the classes on them, and these are the feasts that the Bible says that we will do for all eternity. And so our church follows the feast, and therefore we recognize these feasts. Now, today, we're going to be talking about stones. And why stones? Why things that's going on? We know that the stones were around. They were not new. They were not freely invented. Uh, these are stones that were on the earth when Jesus walked on the planet. And if you'd open up your Bibles to Luke 19... I'm going to go verse 28, but I'm kind of going to jump through there all the way down to 40. And this is when Jesus sent out his disciples to get a cult. This is a, talking about when Jesus was coming into Jerusalem, which most people we call Palm Sunday, which we will be celebrating next month because we will be celebrating it on the Passover, not on the solar equinox. Jesus died on the Passover. Keep that in mind. He did not die on the solar equinox. We'll be talking about that some other time later on. But here Jesus is talking. And he says, go get a colt. And he comes in. I want to focus down to 37. Then as he was drawing near descent on the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. This is the, what the Israelites were yelling. Blessed is the king. We should be doing that every Sunday. And some of the Pharisees, the religious leaders, called him to the crowd and said, Teacher, rebuke them. And this is where it takes off my sermon. But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these kept silent, the stones would immediately cry out. Jesus is saying that the stones will cry out. If the church doesn't speak up and the church doesn't start teaching and the church don't quit playing theology and start teaching doctrine from the Word of God, the stones will start speaking. Remember, God used a donkey to get his message across. God can use a stone to get his message across. He would rather use us. He would rather for us to be obedient to him and do what he has told us to do. Now, a couple years ago, we went to Israel. Israel's filled with stones. Stones everywhere. Matter of fact, I think your farmers here would know there's stones in the fields. They seem like they keep growing. I know down there where I live at, there's a farmer that, that goes across. When I used to walk around their field, I used to pick up the stones and throw it to the side. And... Not too long ago, the farmer asked me, he says, why aren't you picking up the stones anymore? I says, because your wife told me not to walk around your field. <laughs> so I picked a different route to walk. And he goes, you can go back. I said, yeah. But it seemed like the stones, could you imagine if the stones could speak? Could you imagine the history that they could reveal? The things that they have seen. These stones that come up in the fields of Indiana, these were around during the flood. They were around when we had the great melt, when the glaciers, from I was told, these glaciers were all the way down to southern Indiana. And it melted. You know, I always wondered about global warming. I wonder if it was those guys in the caves with a little fire that made the glaciers melt. Was it man? It was God. And God changes the climate as he wills. He's in control. Man is not. Man thinks they are, but they're not. And here the Pharisees are saying, shut them down. And, he, and Jesus said, no. Because we should be shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna. We should be shouting, here comes the Lord. Matter of fact, every Sunday morning we should be shouting, come, 
the Lord. Come into this household. Lord, we want to shout. We want to praise you. But what do we do? We do the Pharisees. Be quiet. Sit down. Go over there. We should be rejoicing. Our last church we did in Africa, we walked in there and they were singing and they were rejoicing. They were having a blast. You know, I wish we could do that. They didn't have a guy up here on stage with all the instruments. They didn't have a guy leading the worship. And they were, just, they were all just praising God. And they probably weren't in tune. They probably weren't following some theological or, or some music theory. But you could see in their faces they were glowing. They were happy. Those people would have been people that the Pharisees would have said, shut down, keep quiet. I can see Jesus saying to them, if they don't praise me, the stones will. And we're there on this mountainside, and God was being revealed through his people. And so what, let's talk about these stones. Jesus had a lot of contacts with stones during his ministry. The creator that created these stones had a lot of things with them. Jesus walked on these stones. He sat on them. He prayed on them, he wept on them, and he bled on them. If these stones could talk, what stories would they tell us today? What understanding would we hear what these stones would say? And I'm not talking about the history of what man has done. Could you imagine what the stones would be talking about our lives? If these stones could talk about what we have done? But I'm not talking about our condemnation. I'm talking about the lifting up of Jesus and talking about what Jesus did, the creator of the universe, when he left glory and came to earth. If God gives me the liberty today, I'd like to take us to us a few places where Jesus came in contact with the stones. If these stones would talk, what great stories would they tell us? There would not be mankind's filtration of the story. There would not be mankind's theory of what they think Jesus said. These stones would be able to speak exactly what Jesus was saying. So let's look at the, some of these stones today. If you turn to Matthew chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, it's on page 1894 of your pew Bible. If stones on the Mount of Temptation, now we're talking, this is the begin, let's go back to the beginning. We started off close to the end of his ministry. Let's go to the beginning of his ministry. Jesus had just been baptized. He had just come up out of the water. The Holy Spirit had come down on him like a dove. And we hear God saying, this is my good and faithful servant. This is my son, my beloved son. This is the only place in Scripture that we have the Trinity show up at the same time. We have Jesus in the body, we have the Holy Spirit coming down, and we have God speaking. And what could those stones tell us today? What those stones, when Jesus left there, he went up to this mountain, and the devil come tempting him. Matter of fact, there's a lesson in itself. Once you start moving to God... Beware of that devil that's going to come and try to break or steal or destroy what God has done for you. So he's standing there. He's talking to them. Look what it says. Matthew 4, verses 3 and 4. Now when the temper, temp, tempter had come to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. He is the bread of life. But the devil's saying, talk to the stones. Let the stones reveal it. What stories could that stones, could you imagine if you were there, or the old saying, if I was a fly on the wall, I could hear the conversations that was going on. Can you imagine if that stones that was standing there saw the power of God and saw the power of darkness collide with each other? Could you imagine the stories that they could be telling? And how would it affect our lives? 
I wonder how many times has the tempter come to us? How many times have we fallen short of what God has for us? Look at 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 5.21. This is the Son of God, and it's on page 1775. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. Here's God, perfect, from creation, from the moment he was born in the little town of Bethlehem, from the 33 years of his ministry, 33 and a half years of him walking on the planet, he stayed sinless. All of these stones would testify that he lived a sinless life and that he became sin for us because when he took on sin at the old rugged cross 2,000 years ago, he claimed our sin upon himself. He was sinless. The innocent blood shed on Calvary, sin and Satan were forever defeated. Why then does the church feel defeated? Why then are we so looking for the entertainment in churches instead of looking for the truth of God's word? He is still our Savior today. He is the same Jesus that walked out of Bethlehem when he was two years old and fled to Egypt. He's the same Savior that was called out of Egypt and lived in Nazareth. He's the same Savior that left Nazareth and taught at 12 years old in the temple. He's the same Savior that walked and got baptized when he was roughly about 30 years old. It's the same Savior that came up out of the water. It's the same Savior that went to the Mount of, of, of Temptation. He went up there for 40 days. He was hungry. He knew what it is to be hungry. It's the same Savior that the devil tried to convince to turn stone into bread. He is the same Savior that we have today. If you go to John, John chapter 2, verse 6. We see a different stone speaking now. I love this story of this marriage. Most people get, and what I hear about this, this is when Jesus changed water into wine. That's all I hear. Well, Jesus changed water into wine. Jesus telling you that you can drink wine. Is that what you get out of this story? You miss the whole point. Things happen in this story. Look at John 2, 6. Now, there were six water pots of stone. According to the manner of the purification of the Jews, concerning 20 to 30 gallons apiece. This was dirty water. This six stones, six by fact, represents man. Six, because man was created on the sixth day. Six, six, six. What do we get 666 from in the, in the in book of Revelations? Man, 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 the Antichrist, the false trinity. Six pots of dirty water that was used to washing feet that was dipped in there. They didn't care what the condition of that water was. It was six stones sitting there. Talks about six human beings. The stones, what they would talk. Could you imagine the six representing man, but the six stones saying, we were always used for the refuge, for the washing. What dirty water was put into us. This meant nothing. Anytime somebody dipped on it, it was only for no good. It was to wash the floors or wash the feet. Isn't that what mankind has become? We're so filled with the world. We're so filled with filth and dirt that God in these six, star, in these six stones Change that filth and that dirty into the best wine. You and I were those stones. You and I were those stones that were filled with the world, filled with dirty stuff, filled with stuff that was an abomination to God. But yet, Jesus says, fill it to the brim. Don't worry about what the devil does to you. Bring it on. Because we are now transformed 
Everything that He put in us is transformed now into holiness and we are now the holy temple of God and therefore we are in holiness and we've been transformed. But many people forget the first miracle that Jesus did recorded in the Bible was turning water into wine. These six stones, the first miracle that God did to your life was transforming you from a lost person to a saved person. First time you were filled with the Holy Spirit, first time you were transformed was right here when these stones were looking at. Could you imagine what these stones could have done? These pots were made for dirty water. Nothing more than a a bucket, a mop bucket. Have you ever seen a mop bucket? What do you use a mop bucket for? How does that water look? Could you imagine you at a marriage party and the pastor tells you, go get that mop bucket that's dirty water and bring it out and then go and dip into it and go and serve it to the elders. Think about it. Or better yet, serve it to your boss. Your boss goes, hey, I'm just got you. I just recommended you for a great promotion. Really? So here, let me serve you. Go to the mop bucket, dip in a cup of a, a, a coffee, and go to your bosses. Thank you very much. Here, this is for you. You see, the faith. The lessons there, the servants, the servants did exactly that. There's so much stories here. These stones could be telling us, could be telling us the moment that Jesus quit being Mary's son and became Mary's savior. It was at that moment when Mary came to him, the mother of Jesus, said, Jesus, look at this. They're out of wine. Just why are you bothering me? It's not my time yet. In other words, it's not his calling. And then he changes tone. He says, woman, at that moment, he quit being the son of Mary and became Mary's savior. The transformation occurred right then at the same time that the first miracle and those six pots of dirty water was turned into perfect wine. It's the same miracle that Jesus has done in us the first time we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Power. Could you imagine if those stones would be talking? I wonder how old those stones were. Man, they were using us for dirty stuff. We've been here for years. All of a sudden, this man Messiah comes. We don't know when the water was transformed. We, all we know is that the servants obeyed Jesus and filled it to the brim. And it's important, because we are filled to the brim. We're not halfway filled with the Holy Spirit. We're not just touched by the Holy Spirit. We are fulfilled to the brim, to the max of the Holy Spirit in us. But when did that transformation occur? I had the question asked many times. Was it when they filled it, or was it when they dipped the water, the, the, the cup into it? Or was it when they served it that the water changed? When do we show our change? When is it important that this water that had changed these six, these water that was in this dirty water, it's when we are serving. When we get filled with the Holy Spirit, and then we get up out of our chairs and we go and we walk and we do what we're supposed to do and we serve the people and we show them, that's when the miracle changes. That's when people recognize that you have changed. You can get saved in church and be changed and sit here and you're worthless to God. Because God wants you to be His church. He wants you to be His voice. He wants to be His hands and His feet. We are His voice here on earth. We have to proclaim the Word of God 
as it is written, without change and compromise. If it was bad back then, it is bad today. But why? Why do we resist if only those stones could speak? Could you imagine what those stones could tell you when they've witnessed that transformation inside that water? Could you imagine what they could tell us today? Number three, Jacob's well. Look at chapter 4, verse 6. Page 1635, just a few pages over, if you've got the Pew Bible. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour, noontime. A woman of Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me drink, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Could you imagine the, pe the stone sitting there witnessing Jesus talking to this woman, sinful woman? What just happened here? One, the disciples left Jesus to go get food. Many Christians leave Jesus for their work, for their jobs, for their money. They says, well, how can I go to church? How can I do this? I got to go get bread. But if you stay with Jesus, Jesus is the bread of life. Jesus would have given them everything. What witnesses look at what they missed? Because they were hungry. Their belly was hungry. But the stones around that well saw this woman coming. And he said to her in verse 21, Woman, believe me, for the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. You know what you worship for the salvation of the Jews. He knew exactly. People talk about, oh, how dirty she was. He was talking to her about false worship. And because she's worshiping what she does not know. She did not understand what Jesus was. He said, I will give you the living water. What those stones could tell us today. Could you imagine would they see, would they have seen the tears in her eyes when Jesus forgave her? Could they not tell us on how she was moved by Jesus speaking to her when no Jew would speak to her because, one, she was a Samaritan. She was a half-breed. That's why the Jews didn't like her. Besides that, they violated God's word. They decided to have their own worship at their own place. Instead of going to Jerusalem to the altar, they decided to make their own high places. They decided to worship God on their own way. And God, Jesus telling us, you're doing what you do not know. You, it's not the church here you're worshiping at. You don't come here to worship in this building as if this building has some kind of power. You come because you are the living temple. We come together so that we can worship together in the temple of God, in the sanctuary, which is in the hearts of every believer that's in this room. Not the building. That stones will tell you the mission that Jesus came will tell you that here's a man that came to speak to an undeserving woman. He picked the worst one in town to demonstrate his purpose. He came for you and I. The well, the stones on that well will tell us it don't matter how bad you are. It doesn't matter what you've done in the past. It doesn't matter nothing. The Savior that asked for a drink of water is still touching you today, saying, give me water. And Jesus saying, you take my water, you will never thirst. But are we asking Jesus? Are we listening to Jesus? 
are we listening to theologies and Pharisees and Sadducees of today? The stones, I believe, will tell us he still loves the sinners today. He still wants his message to go to those that are fallen. We saw that in Africa. We saw that in many places. He's still seeking and saving all who come to him. John 6, 37. But see, that mission is ours also. Not only do we need to come to Jesus at the living water, but then we got to go and tell people. What did that woman do? She ran and told the men about Jesus. She went and became an evangelist in telling people about Jesus Christ. She went and told people. She didn't just sit there and go, man, this is so great. Lord, thank you for the nice building. Thank you for the air conditioning. Man. No, she went. How hard do you think it was for that woman to go now and talk to those people that looked down on her? That thought she was a nobody because she had how many wives and husbands and cheating and adultery. She was not only a half Jew, but she was also a woman of the world. And she has this encounter at this well. Many of us have had that encounter. We met Jesus at the living well, at the living water, and he has transformed us. But are we willing to go out and talk? I'd love to be able to stand there and look at that stone. Right? Could you imagine being at the exact place where Jesus sat down? Wouldn't that be so cool to be able to sit there and just put your hands on that stone? Wouldn't it be cooler if that stone could just yell back at you? Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. For the Savior sat right here. I can tell you, you have that story. Because the Savior sat right there in your heart. And God is there with you today. Go to John 8, a few pages over. John 8, verse 7. It's on page 1644. This is a story we preached on before. This I'm calling the stones in the temple court. Look what just happened here. This is about that woman. So when they continued asking him and, and raised himself up and said to him, he who is without sin among you, let him throw the stone at her first. We know the story. We know they were in the temple. This woman was caught in adultery. We know they dragged her out. They know that they tried to trick Jesus. And they all stood around because the law says if you commit adultery and you get caught in adultery, you get what? Stoned to death. So you have the stone of judgment in these Pharisees and these religious people that want to stone you. That's happening still today. When we find somebody in our, in our midst, when we find a, a, somebody in our church that has been a brother and a sister and they fall, they fall into sin, what do we do? We want to pick up the stones and stone them because with them, most of the time they commit the spiritual adultery. And so we, do our, we pick up our spiritual rocks and we start making judgment calls upon them. But Jesus says, and I say to every one of us here, you without sin, throw the first one. Can you imagine if those stones could speak? Could you imagine if that you're that stone talking, and you're that Pharisee that's got all this anger and trying to trick Jesus, and the stone is looking up and saying, you are a fool. This is the creator of the universe. You're going to try to trick him? I, if I was that stone, I'd say, you don't even deserve to touch me. Could you imagine what those stones would have said? When Jesus, now here's the thing. Remember, that woman was not just accused of adultery. She was what? 
caught in adultery. Well, right there we pick up the hypocrisy. If you caught a woman in adultery, who's committing adultery with her? The man. Who do they want to stone? The woman. Isn't that a little bit of hypocrisy? Does the law apply to the man? Yes. But the man, I can imagine, when they caught her, caught them, he looked up at him and says, hey, not my fault. It's that woman you gave, you gave me. Did we hear that before? In the garden? It's that woman that you did. And what do the Pharisees do? Okay, woman, let's go. And then they tell Jesus because they try to trick him. These stones would be sitting there, I can imagine them just laughing. If Jesus would have said stone her, he would, they'd have asked him, says, where's your forgiveness? Where's your mercy? If Jesus says don't stone him, oh, you're in violation of the law, and God gave the law to Moses, and you're in violation, so how can you be the Messiah? What did Jesus say? He said, fine. Okay. Well, first he says, any of you that are without sin, cast the first stone. I was wondering if a stone that somebody picked up, I wonder if the man that got caught in the adultery was with those guys with the stone. Saying, I'll get rid of my guilt. But what did they do? One by one, bloop, bloop. Could you imagine those stones retelling that story? Each one of those Pharisees and Sadducees, each one of those men that had a stone, could you imagine the stories that each one would have had? They had just come from the Temple Mount. They had just come and I believe the stones would be telling you, same as the stones with that woman at the well, Jesus comes and he brings forgiveness. He does not come with a stone of judgment, but he comes as a forgiving Savior. Jesus says, where are those that accuse you? Here's the difference. The woman says, my Lord, my God, basically. And Jesus says, I don't condemn you either. Because, see, she called on the name of Jesus. And she was instantly forgiven. But what happened to those men? They ran away from their Savior. I wonder if these are the same people that were sitting in the courtyard a few years later yelling, crucify him, crucify him. I wonder if these are the same people that were there to try to get Jesus now because of their stone of righteousness was destroyed. I wonder if we in our churches have that stone and we condemn our fellow brothers and sisters that fall into sin, that we're ready for them to pick up that stone of accusation, that stone of condemnation, and start to beat on them throwing at him. How could you be? You've been a brother for so many years. How could you do this? You know that God hates us. You know that you have sinned against the Almighty God. You know that you're... All these are stones of accusation. Why not say, brother, sister, Lord has mercy. Why don't you come back into the fold where we carry not the stone of accusations, but we take the blood of Jesus, and we believe in forgiveness. We believe in making yourself whole. You know, when Cain killed Abel, that stone that he used to kill Abel is the same stone that these people had. It's the same stone that Christians have when they start talking about other Christians. The blood of, G of, of Abel, when it hit the ground, in the book of Hebrews, it says, it yells, vengeance, avenge me, avenge me. 
And many times we are at that place and we've been attacked by fellow Christians. We've been attacked by fellow believers and our blood has been spilled. We've been devastated. We've been knocked down. What do we yell? Lord, avenge me! In the book of Hebrews, Jesus says, but the blood of Jesus, when it hit the ground, when it hit those stones, it says, Father, forgive them. We are covered by the blood of Jesus, not the blood of Cain. We have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus, not by the blood of accusation. We have been made whole. I can imagine what those stones would be telling us in the temple court. Could you imagine what what conversations could be carried on when a sinner comes to him? It's like that woman. He doesn't bring the accusation. If you notice, Jesus never accused her. Jesus listened. But when she called his name, what did Jesus say to her? I find no guilt in you either. I condemn you neither. I don't attack you either. What can we learn from those stones? Go to John 11. Page 1652, a few pages over. I'm going to change gears a little bit. And I want to talk about the stone at the tomb of Lazarus. We've talked about the stones everywhere, the accusations, the stones of forgiveness. We've noticed that the stones have been used to accuse Jesus. The devil, they've witnessed all of these things. I wonder what the stones in the tomb of Lazarus would have said. Look at John 11, verse 39. Jesus said, take away the stone, Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there's a stench, for he has been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not say for you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying. We'll stop right there. Lazarus had died and was buried. When we were in Africa, we attended with part attended with, spoke at a, for a little bit at a funeral. And I don't know if Donnie or Ralph saw it or not, they were spraying the spray around the coffins. That's because they don't embound. No embalming or nothing. The bodies were fresh there. They, were, they weren't fresh. They are starting to stink. So they put in perfume to keep the smell down. And they stayed there from 9.30, 9 to 9.30 until 4 o'clock in the heat. For two dead persons. Lazarus was in this tomb. Jesus says, take the stone away. There's many stories here the stones could tell us. He could tell us about the moment that the power of God came and rejuvenated that body. When that body was made whole again. Could you imagine those stones witnessing that power of God transforming and could you imagine the stones that could be saying, these, these people, geez, they already told them, hey, that thing stinks. But what were they doing? It didn't make sense to open up that tomb because they knew that Lazarus was dead. They knew it's been four days and the body already started to decompose. They knew all of these things. So it took an extra amount of faith to sit there and says, I don't care what I know. I'm going to do what Jesus tells me. And they removed the stone and they saw a great miracle because they were obedient. Could you imagine what those stones could be saying? Look at the faith of these people. How could they have that much faith in Jesus? And then could you imagine what the stones were saying? The power it would talk about. Raising a dead person physically. But he does that to us every day spiritually. Sometimes we've been dead for years spiritually. 
We have gotten so deep in our hearts and our, we've been so dead and buried that it takes somebody with the faith to take that rock away to bring you out so that you will become living people again, a living church again, and not a dead church. Many people today are not looking for the power of the, of the God that raised Lazarus, but they're looking for the power of the entertainment. That's what they look for when they come to the church. They did not go to the tomb of, of Lazarus for the party. Jesus went with a purpose. And he called Lazarus, come forward. And the rock, the, everything was moved out. Could you imagine what they were saying? Could you imagine what these stones witnessed? Not only the body being restored, not only the faith of the people removing the stone, but the power of Jesus saying, Lazarus, come out. He is saying that to each one of us today. I don't care how bad you've been, no matter how dead you think you are, Jesus is saying, come forward. And we got a church that is willing to move the rocks out of the way so they make room for you to come and to know that you are a part of the living church. He is raising hell-bound sinners where job is to empty hell and fill up heaven. It's to take the gospel of Jesus Christ to remove the obstacles that keep people from coming to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. He can take life that's been ruined and wrecked by sin and He can touch it by His grace. But what I love about our Lord, He can do it more than once. He can do it a hundred times if, if it's needed. Jesus touched you at one time. You walk, Maybe you walked down an aisle. You felt the burdens off your shoulders. You felt Christ coming. And then you went back into the world and after a few years you lost that touch. Maybe you were alive like Lazarus and died. And Christ is calling you back. He says, come. Church, let's remove the rocks. Let's remove the stones. Let's clear the path so that people can hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Can you imagine what would happen? We would see dead people, sinful, spiritual dead people coming up. People that were so down and out become a powerful voice for God. These stones would be able to tell you what it feels like to have the master's hand touch them. If you go to Luke... 19, verse 37. And it's on page 1617 of your pew Bible. Luke 19, 37 through 40. We're talking about the stones around Jerusalem. This is where we started. This is where we began the sermon. With the stones in the streets of Jerusalem witnessing Jesus Christ coming on a donkey. These are stones that watch Jesus coming on a Sunday. And then within four days, He was the same stones would be telling these same people now are yelling what? Crucify him, crucify him. These stones probably could not understand. How could we witness so many things, see the power of God in so many places, and then turn so quickly on him? He was being held as a king, and within the week. He was being hung on a cross. Many Christians come. They come forward and they're looking for the goosebump chasers, what I call them. 
They're looking for this goosebump feelings. You are not saved by feelings. Feelings will get you down and take you to a road of destruction. The devil will touch your feelings and make your feelings feel good or bad. God does not touch your feelings. God touches your heart. He transforms your heart. He transforms you. He transforms your mind by the renewing of his word. It's not a feeling. It's a decision. It's something that God has called you to do. Something that God needs us to do. We may glorify Him at a church service. As many people have said, I heard a pastor say this one day, the devil don't mind your, church, your Sunday morning service. The devil doesn't mind your praise. The devil doesn't mind your singing. The devil don't even mind your hearing on Sunday morning. When as soon as you walk out the door, you serve him for the next six days. Monday through Friday, or Monday through Saturday, or Sunday afternoon, how many times do you leave a service, even at lunchtime, you start talking and gossiping about the church, about the pastor. You start gossiping about things that's going on. You leave the church filled with the Spirit. By the time you leave the door, you have blocked him up, and now you're back to throwing stones again. The devil don't mind that. Because you see, the devil's not jealous. But the devil knows either you're all in or you're not in at all. You cannot be a Sunday morning Christian and think that you're going to walk through paradise. The devil may tell you, ah, you did okay. You checked the block. You went to church. Maybe you even paid your tithes. Plan rebellion with plan repentance, there is no remission. It's very important to get that concept in your mind. We are not a church that you can pay for your salvation. We're not a church that you can pay to pay for your sins. There's only one person that paid for your sins, and he hung on the cross. We are a church, I pray, that points you not to the cross only, but to an empty tomb. You see, Jesus had to die on that cross to pay for our sins, but he had to go to that empty tomb. He had to be made alive because there is death. At the tomb, there's life. We need to understand the glory of God. What will these stones be telling us? What will these stones be saying about our walk? Do we walk into the church, and I have done this, so I'm not preaching that at the choir, preaching to myself. You come to church, you have an argument with your wife, you might even be yelling in the car, and as soon as you, you, walk, you walk out of the house, then you walk into the church, hi, man, so great to see you, oh man, I'm so happy, you hypocrite. But you see, that's what they were doing. That's what these stones would be telling us today. I wonder what the stones around Peru would be saying about us. About how many times we come to church glorifying, raising our voices to God. It ain't by Monday we're already in the world again. I wonder if the stones around here would be the same, the same thing that these people did when Jesus came in. But you see, just as those people praised Jesus coming in, 
We need to continue praising him. Not only on that Sunday morning when he comes in, but throughout the week, throughout the rest of our life. But you see, praise is not an option. Praise is a command of God that we were created to praise Him. Psalms 47.1, Hebrews 13.15 tells us it is a command to praise Him. It is a command to raise His voice and call upon His name. You don't feel like it? Too bad. I wonder how Job felt. Just read Job chapter 1. You think he felt like praising God? Maybe in your darkest hour is when you need to come, get on your knees, and raise your voice. Maybe you are that Lazarus that have died. You feel like you've been abandoned. You feel like you've been in a grave. You feel like God has abandoned you. You feel like everything. All you got to do is look up and see the rock move out of the way. And Jesus says, come out. Be alive again. Become what I created you to be. A vessel of good. A place of worship. I don't want the stones doing my yelling for me. Trust me, I can do my own yelling. And then we go to Luke. 22, verse 41. It's on page 1623. And he, Jesus, was withdrawn from them about a stone throw away, and he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. Drop down a little bit to 44. Then his sweat became like great bloods falling down on the ground. If Jesus, in his agony, can go to a separate place, could you imagine that stone that he sat there and he cried? He knows the cup that's coming. He knows that he's going to be suffering. He knows that he's going to go through this tribulation, which many people are teaching that the church will not go through. Jesus knew he was going through that tribulation. And he cried. His agony. He was fully man. Yeah, he was fully God, but at this moment, his human nature was trying to take over. He was struggling with his human nature just like we struggle with our human nature. He cries, but he says, Father, not my will, but yours. And God sent an angel to strengthen him. How much more would he do for you and I? when we're in that agony. You see, he didn't take the agony away. He didn't take the, the fear away. He didn't take all of that from him. All of that was still there. He was just strengthened by an angel, by the Spirit, and the God lifted him up, encouraged him. Many times we go through bad things, and it doesn't go away, but we are strengthened to go through those things. Maybe you've got to cry. Maybe there's a time of saying, Lord, as David did when his son was dying, when he took the time and cried, but even then, God did not relieve King David of his son dying. But when King David knew his son was dead, that God's judgment was made, what did King David do? He got up on his feet got washed, got cleaned, and went on with life. Because he knew that the God that he served will take care of his son. We need to have that understanding. I would love to see what that rock would have said when he saw his creator 
leaning on his on that rock and tears coming down and hitting that rock. Could you imagine that that rock what he would say? Could you imagine him knowing that the creator of the universe, the one that spoke that rock into existence, his tears are landing on his rock. What stories could they tell you and I? How many times have you cried for salvation or cried for forgiveness? How many times have I been on my knees and asking God to forgive me for what I have done? I wish those stones that were there would be able to remind me of the time when God forgave me and made me whole again. Jesus knew that Satan was going to try to kill him. Jesus knew that his body, his earthly body, was going to be broken and suffering. But he also knew the will of God that he'd be victorious. Calvary was his goal. And when he reached the cross, he finished with bruises. He finished with beaten, blood everywhere. But his job was over. He died knowing that he came for that purpose. What cross are we carrying today? What cross does God have you carry? Are you throwing that cross out because you can't handle it? God will never give you more than you can handle. In the army, we used to always tell you, your mind will quit before your body does. Your mind will tell you that you can't take it anymore before your body does. And that's why we used to tell on these long work, ruck marches, we had to walk 12 miles carrying 65 to 75 pound rucksacks. We had to average 15 minute miles on mountainous terrain. And when somebody quit, we kicked them out of the special forces. We told, we used to tell the people, you can only get recycled if you get the Kathumpa Award. Anybody know what a Kathumpa Award is? When you're walking, you just go Kathump, and you fall out. When your body quits. Not your mind. You see, at the garden, devil was trying to get to, to Jesus' mind. God said no. And Jesus said no. God's will be done. His body was beaten to a point where he could no longer carry the cross. Did somebody come and help him carry the cross? If your cross is too burdensome, God will send someone to help you. What these stones have said, and then we go to our last one. Go to Matthew 28, verses 1 and 6. It's on page 1540. Next slide. The garden tomb. We talked about the rocks throughout his ministry. Now, these rocks that were cut, a tomb that was cut for a rich man. What we stones would be saying, look at Mark 28, verses 1 and 6. And now, after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week... What day is that? What's the first day of the week? First day of the week. Sunday. Jesus did not change the Sabbath. Okay? Began to dawn. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like a lightning and his clothes as white as snow. That stone would have witnessed the moment of the resurrection of Jesus. 
that stone would have witnessed this angel moving that stone and rock away. Remember the Lazarus? Who moved the rock? The people did. And in Jesus, an angel did. Your rock that's keeping you dead can be removed by a Bible study. It can be removed by the Holy Spirit. That stone would have seen the moment Jesus rose from the grave. The moment that he came out. Look at verse 6. He is not here, the, the angel is talking, for he is risen. As he said, come, see the place where the Lord lay, and be quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead, and indeed he is going before you into Galilee, where you will see him. Behold, I have told you. So they went quickly from the tomb. Mary, Magdalene, and the other Mary did not come because they believed Jesus had been risen. They came to what? To put the spices and prepare the body. I don't care why you come to the empty tomb. All I care that you show up and you look inside. You'll notice that we don't worship a dead Jesus. We don't worship a Jesus still hanging on a cross. We worship a Jesus that was risen. And in John it says when you looked in there, his face, his coverings and everything was folded up very neatly. There's a Jewish tradition, and it is a tradition. What, what that means what? This is not Bible, okay? But there's a tradition that says when you eat and you get your napkins and you curl up your hands and you throw it, you, you just put the napkin on the table, the waiter will not move the food because you're not done eating. But when you get done eating and you fold it up, he knows that he's coming back. I'm sorry, I got it backwards. The wrinkled up one is you're not coming back. That you're not coming back, you're finished. But if you fold the napkin, they will leave it alone because you're not finished. And in John, it says his, his clothes was folded, which would tell me he's not finished. He's coming back. And he's coming back one day with a shout of an archangel. Is, is that quiet? No. With the sound of a trumpet, that's a whisper, right? No. And what did he see? What did those stones report? He lives forever. He's interceding for us right now in Hebrews 7.25. Yes, I'm glad, and I'm also saddened that Jesus had to die on the cross for my sins. But I'm more glad... And I'm more happy that he won and he got the victory for us. And therefore, my sins are covered and I have been made whole through him. Those stones will tell you, why are you such down? Why are you so, feel so defeated? They say right now that churches across America are losing people. Look at our empty pews sometimes. Yes. But I will tell you this. There's going to be a remnant. And there are going to be those that are going to hold on to the Word of God that will not compromise, that will not fall away. And one day we will hear that trumpet and one day we will see the victorious Jesus coming on a white horse and bring victory to this fallen world. The Stonewood says He is alive. Why are you looking for Him among the dead? Many of us today, we live at the cross. We live there, we nail the sins to the cross, but we stay at the cross. There's a time you need to go to the cross. You need to nail your sins to the cross. But then you need to go down the road and get to that garden tomb. Look at that empty tomb, knowing that that Savior has given you the victory, that you are alive, and that He is alive. In Italy... Up on a mountain, 
This guy, he went up, he, these people that would always go to this mountaintop, there was a big cross up there, and people would come to that cross and pray. And it says a beautiful view of the, of the uh, landscape. And it says they get really moved. This pastor went up there and was praying, and he saw the heavy trafficked area where people would go to the cross. But he noticed a small little path that led away from it, barely ever used. He got curious, followed that little path, and it led to a cave. And the sign on it says, he's alive. What are you looking for in a tomb? And the whole moral of the story was, people were coming to the cross, but they were staying at the cross. Church, you got to go to the cross. you got to nail your sin to the cross, but you can't stay there. That sin is there. I don't want to sit there and keep looking at a dead Jesus. I want to go look at an empty tomb, a risen Christ, a one that's alive. We need to understand our lives are tied with His. We will only live as long as Jesus lives. And the last one. Turn to Acts 1, 10 through 11. 1673. The stones on Mount Olive, Olives. Look at verse 10. And while they looked steadfastly forward to heaven, as he went up, who's he? Jesus. Behold, two men stood by them in white appeal, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into the heavens? There's an important message here. These stones will be telling you about a bunch of theology that's out there. You want to answer the theology on how Jesus returns? Continue reading. This is what the angels told the men of Galilee. This is not theology. This is doctrine. Theology is how to explain doctrine. This same Jesus, who we've been talking about all morning, right? Who was taken up from you into heaven will come in like manner, as you saw him go into heaven. So, what would these stones be telling us? Jesus went physically through the eyes, saw, they saw him, what? Ascend into heaven. They were standing there watching the heavens. The angels come to him and say, what are you doing? We're waiting for that guy that just went up. What did he say to him? You shall return in like manner. So how is Christ going to return? In the clouds, coming down on Mount Olives, just like he went. All right? Who's going to be a witness? We are. Just like his disciples witnessed him going we will witness him coming if we are alive. And if he shows up in the eastern skies and we're alive, in a twinkle of an eye, we will meet him in the sky. And we will reign with him for a thousand years. The dead in Christ, those of us that have died during the tribulation, will rise at that moment. That's the first resurrection. No Mary Poppins. Poof. He will return just as he promised. Here's my question for you. Are we ready? 2024, 2025 just might be the year when our Savior returns to claim his people. It may be a hundred years from now, but it may be soon. My question, are you ready? If the stones around your life could speak, what would they be telling you today? Just as the same things that the stones around the stories of Jesus would have been telling us. 
Will they be telling us about the time we tripped and fell? Will they be telling us about the time that we surrendered to Jesus? Or will they be telling us about the times that we got mad, got angry at our brothers and sisters? Maybe we need those stones speaking to us today. Maybe we just need to go to Jesus and have Jesus touch our lives again and again and again. It's never too late. Now, I'm going to pray, I'm going to close, but I would like to pray for Barb Coons. But before we do that, I'm going to clarify something, and I'm going to make sure it's online. Healing. No person has power to heal. Only Jesus can heal. And Jesus heals at his discretion. We do not have the authority to command Jesus to make a healing when we demand it. It is not lack of faith. Matter of fact, it's, a, it's an increase in your faith when you have a sickness, when you're hurting and you hold on and you do not lose your faith and you continue praising God. That is extraordinary faith. I wish sometimes I'd have that kind of faith. I read stories about people being martyred. You know, I read a story in southern Egypt. When they crucified this, they had this guy crucified. And they told him, the Muslims did. They said, this will stop as long as the moment you reject Jesus. You don't even have to accept Muhammad. Just reject Jesus. He said no. They brought his daughters out, raped her in front of him, cut their daughters up. This will stop the moment you deny Jesus. He said no. Brought his wife out, mutilated her. This will stop the moment. You reject Jesus. He said, no. I wish I had that kind of faith. That's an awesome faith. See, he died, and a Muslim wrote that story. Didn't take him out of that tribulation. Didn't take him through it. Didn't... Boop, pop him out of there. Didn't save his family. But I can imagine they're walking down the streets of gold today. Praising God. No more pain. No more tears. No more anything. So, JT, come up and sing while we lead our sings. Barbara, could you come forward, please? I said some of the elders come up.